chapter one. I just want to read a few verses of scripture here to kind of start our time in the word. Mark chapter one, starting in verse nine. It says this in God's word. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and John baptized him in the Jordan River. This is speaking of John the Baptist. John the Baptist, remember, um, what's so cool about John the Baptist is he was preparing the way for Jesus to come. And John the Baptist was prophesied in the book of Malachi, that he would come and prepare the way for Jesus. And uh, here Jesus is coming to John. I mean, can you imagine that? Like you're waiting on the Messiah and then the Messiah shows up and he's like, yo, Pastor Todd, will you baptize me? It's like, whoa, wait a second here. Verse 10, as Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And then a voice from heaven said, this is interesting because this is really a picture of the Trinity. Jesus, and then the Father's about to speak here. We've got the Holy Spirit descending. Here's what the Father says, and I think this is important, and this is what the Father speaks over us if we're in Christ Jesus. He says this, you are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. Now this is powerful, and I'm not preaching on this today, but we need to get this in our spirit because this gospel of Mark is all about talking about Jesus being a servant. For the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. But here's what I want us to know today. There's a big difference between serving God for love versus serving God from love. I think there's a lot of Christians in our culture that are serving God for love, trying to earn his love by what we do. No, we're already loved in Christ, and from that place we serve him. This is freedom, y'all. When you get this revelation of identity in Christ, so it's sonship before being a servant. Are you with me today? All right, that was just kind of an appetizer. You like some edamame today? Okay. All right, now here's, here's really what we're gonna get into today, starting in verse 12. So immediately after this mountaintop experience, you have to picture this moment that Jesus was there in the beginning with the Father and with the Holy Spirit creating the world. Then Jesus volunteers, right, to leave heaven, perfection, come to planet Earth. So you can imagine this moment where he's hearing from his Father in heaven, the Holy Spirit is descending on him. You can imagine what this moment must have felt like for Jesus. Then it says this, right after this mountaintop experience, the Spirit then compelled Jesus to go into the wilderness. I think that's really interesting. There are some versions that say the Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness. Verse 13, where he was tempted by Satan for 40 days. Oh, Lord Jesus, there's that word temptation, ah, equal opportunity offender, huh? He was out among the wild animals and the angels took care of him. If you're taking notes today, the title of today's message is Overcoming Temptation with a subtitle of this, stay ready, don't get ready. I love to say this, you gotta stay ready so you don't gotta get ready. Lord, thank you for this word. I pray that as we as we lean into your scriptures, that you would strengthen us to overcome temptation. Thank you that we don't have to do it in our own strength, but you've given us the helper, the counselor, the one that walks with us, the Holy Spirit. Lord, today, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would, even right now, just eliminate distractions in our hearts. I pray for vulnerability and honesty, that every wall that is lifted up would come crashing down I pray even right now that as we lean into temptation and, and already just with that word, there's people in the room that are feeling condemnation. We know that's not from you. I pray that you would move it from condemnation to conviction. Pull them closer, don't push them away. I pray they would know there's no judgment in the house of God, that you love them right where they're at, but you love them enough not to keep them there. I pray that today we would grow, we would lean in and you would receive the glory. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, can you say amen today? Amen. So uh, my oldest son, Judah, started his soccer season. And week one, 
uh, we were playing at the center, the indoor facility right there uh, off of Giles, and it was nice. The elements uh, weren't getting to us, but then every game moving forward is outside, and so yesterday we, you know, I rode with my pops, and they got to come and watch Judah play soccer and run around, and we didn't really dress for the weather, did we? I think we uh, underestimated the wind, and so we're all snuggled up out there, and the announcer gets on the thing, and he's like, hey, by the way, if you want to get some fresh donuts, we've got a, 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 a trailer right over here. Just go check it out. Hudson's Donuts is with us today. Can we give it up for them? And everybody shouts and screams, and then all the kids come rushing over, didn't they? Right away, Journey and Royce, can we go get some donuts? Now, you don't ask that question to a dad that has a sweet tooth. I looked at him and I said, well, when Judah goes and sits over on the bench, we will gladly go get some donuts. So we walk over. Now, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what kind of donuts these are. I don't know if they're donut holes. I don't know if they're big donuts, small donuts. Are these fresh donuts? Or did y'all just go to like hy V and then you're just reselling donuts? Like, I don't know what to expect. But we pull up, uh, me and my pops, we go get get the donuts, we pull up to this little trailer, and it was awesome. They were, they were literally making fresh donuts. Like, these things were fresh. Like, I saw the guy mixing the batter, and I'm like, oh, Pops, you better pray for me, man. <laughs> we, uh, we looked at each other, I was like, how many do you think we should get? I mean, there was a whole crew with us, and you could order them in sixes or twelves, and so, of course, we got a dozen. And after we put in the order, I kind of looked at him before, uh, before we paid, and I said, I don't know if that's enough. <laughs> so we put in another order of six. And um, so we, we, get, you know, we get these donuts. The lady, the lady hands us um, these donuts. They came out in this tray. I mean, this is the actual tray that I was... You, they stole my heart, I'm just telling you. And uh, these things came out, and I mean, it was like the steam was coming off of them. I was like, ooh, those are fresh. So of course, you know, I was trying to be other-centered and just wait till, no, of course, I just grabbed one. I'm like, I'm gonna try these. <laughs> taste test, baby. Not Costco on Sundays. I like, right now, we're gonna taste test these things. Listen, I'm trying to, I, wanna, I want to go and be able to eloquently describe how good these donuts are to all the people we're taking them to. Are you with me? And so um, we get these donuts, and you can see we went with the cinnamon sugar. Oh. Now, this is a day-old donut. So this thing's a little bit more stiff than it was yesterday. I mean, it melted in your mouth, didn't it? You ever had a donut like that? So good. So I get over there, and of course, Royce and Journey are stoked. And uh, right away, I said, hey, you can have two donuts. Two, two. And so, of course, they, they knock out the two. And, um, and then I'm, you know, I'm saving some donuts for their older brother, Judah. And uh, so I have three donuts left. And I'm trying to watch the game, so I just put the donuts on the floor like this. And I'm standing here. And uh, you already know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> Next thing you know, uh, it, it wasn't a dog, but it was Royce bent over like a dog. <laughs> My man is on all fours. I'm like watching the game and I look down and he's just like. <laughs> he's like lean. Now, y'all know the history with Royce, Royce, don't you? This was my guy, remember? The one that was sneaking in the pantry? Yeah, that one. I asked him yesterday, I said, Why, why'd you always sneak? And he's like, I'm like, what were you sneaking for? Chocolate. <laughs> Candy. So I look down and I'm like, no, I'm sorry, son. Those are for Judah. You better get, he, he was tempted. He want, I mean, this man was tempted. You could see it on his face. I mean, he wanted another one so bad. He, and when I said no, he got so close to that thing, he just had to smell it one more time. <laughs> you know, I, I, this moment was happening and, and he didn't even know that, that you know, I, this week I'm, God's asking me, sent me on assignment to preach about overcoming temptation. 
I started to think that, you know, Royce is not the only one in this building right now that experienced temptation this week. So I want you to think, maybe it's not a donut. But the question is, is in this season, what is the temptation in your life that's coming against you? And the second question I would ask you is, are you overcoming that temptation or is that temptation overcoming you? You know, if we're just really honest, I think that we all experience temptation. There are moments when we overcome because the overcomer lives in us, and there are times that we are overcome by the temptation. Anybody wanna be honest in church today? Anybody wanna be vulnerable in church? And it's like I shared earlier, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that a righteous man falls seven but gets up eight. The key is just not laying down when you fall. We gotta get back up, we gotta keep moving, we gotta keep going, and we read today in the scripture that right on the heels of Jesus, being baptized, and really this is the inauguration of his ministry, the beginning of his ministry. He's beginning, gonna begin stepping into what God created him for, the assignment on his life, and the very first thing on the other side of that is, is the Holy Spirit leading him into the wilderness. The wilderness. And, you know, if you're around church for long enough and you begin Catching the lingo, I love it, because my pops yesterday was like, I hear you always talking like, you say like uh, season. I'm in a season. He's like, what do you mean by season? Like, what is that? Isn't it true we use this language like in church and what, what kind of see? I'm in the world, I'm in a wilderness season. <laughs> oh, what's that mean, dude? Like, what, what do you mean wilderness? Like, you, you lost or something? Like, just walking through, you know? Like, let me help you out, brother. Like, what's going on here? When we talk about a wilderness season, what we're really saying is a difficult season. You know, a season, a season of life where even just the normal things that God created us to enjoy are hard to enjoy because we're in trial, we're in tribulation, we're walking through maybe spiritual dryness or, or we're walking through a circumstance that's come into our life that's challenging. And here's what I know is that Wilderness season, sometimes we allow sin to take us into a wilderness season, and sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us into a wilderness season. We have to be able to discern, like, did God lead me into this season of testing? Or is the enemy leading me into a season of temptation? What you need to know today is that God absolutely will test us, but God cannot tempt us. If you're experiencing temptation, that comes from the enemy. If you're experiencing a season of testing, you better believe that God loves to test his children. Why? Because he loves us enough not to keep us there. It's like, it's like the refinement of gold and silver, right? It's season of testing where the impurities come up, they sweep off. Come on, purify me, God. It's a hard prayer to pray, isn't it? Some of you are like, easy, brother, easy. I don't know if I want that. Now, I think we do need a little bit more context to this particular story because the Gospel of Mark, he's getting to the point now. A man's not given much detail. So some of us, we, we want a little bit under, more understanding of, of what's happening uh, in this particular story. So I wanna just read some scripture from Luke chapter four. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, tells this same story with a little more detail. Can I do that? Luke chapter four, three through 13. Just tune in for a second. It says this, then the devil said to him, so this is Jesus in the wilderness, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become a loaf of bread. But Jesus told him, and I love this, we'll get to this later, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will what? Worship me. Jesus replied, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Verse nine, then the devil took him to Jerusalem to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off. For the scriptures say he will order his angels to protect and guard you, 
and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, oh, you better believe it. The devil knows scripture. <laughs> he will use half-truths to deceive you. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, Oh, this is why we're so passionate about self-feeding. Oh, this is why you need to grab a reading guide on your way out today. You must not test the Lord your God, Jesus says. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. He's never done. See, that's, I think the, the greatest deception of our time is most of us think that life is a playground when really it's a battleground. It's a battleground. We're in a battle. Somebody say, we're in a battle. We're in a battle. And I love what Warren Wearsby says. He says this, Satan tempts us to bring out the worst in us, but God can use these difficult experiences to put the best in us. Temptation is Satan's weapon to defeat us, but it can become God's tool to build us. Anybody with me today? What you need to know about the enemy is he's, he's, he's using the same tricks Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's his formula. I hope you just wrote that in your notes, because I'm telling you, whatever your struggle is, it probably fits into one of those three buckets. And I want to show you the parallels, because this is interesting. How many of you know that the Bible refers to Adam in the garden as the first Adam and Jesus being the second Adam? It's interesting, the parallels, if you look at it, all the way back in Genesis, the fall of man, right? When Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of good and evil. Look at, look at this, how the enemy came to Adam, the first Adam, and then how the enemy comes to Jesus. The first is this, to appeal to the physical appetite. In Genesis 3, 1, it says, you may eat of any tree. In Luke 4, 3 and 4, you may eat by changing stones to bread. Appeal to physical appetite. Number two, appeal to personal gain. Genesis 3, 4, you surely will not die. Luke 4, 9 through 12, you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Appeal, and the third one is this, appeal to power or glory. Genesis 3, 5, you will be like God. Luke 4, 5 and 8, you will have glory and authority over all the kingdoms. We're putting him on notice today. Same tricks, same scheme. The same way he tried to deceive Adam and Jesus is the same way that he tries to deceive you and I. How many of you have fallen into temptation and regretted it in here? Anybody in the room can be honest today? Now, why did you give into it? In most cases, it was because you weren't ready for it. Adam wasn't ready, but Jesus was. And I believe that Jesus was because, number one, Jesus knew his identity. And because he knew his identity, he could walk in his authority. Oh, somebody needs to catch this today. Some of you aren't walking in authority because you don't know who you are. You don't know whose you are. And you don't know what God calls you to. The values of the word of God haven't been implanted deep into your soul. And as a result, you're walking around with no authority. No, we're going to get our authority back today. Is anybody with me today? Because when you know your identity, you are more likely to walk in your authority. Will you be like Adam or will you be like Jesus? Somebody repeat this after me. Stay ready so you ain't got to get ready. Stay ready so you ain't got to get ready. Anybody ready to get ready in here today? Ooh, we're going to get ready. We're going to get ready. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, Paul even, he, he affirms this. He says this, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Matthew 26, 41, remember this? Jesus speaking to his disciples, keep watch and pray, here it is, so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, oh, come on, isn't the spirit willing? But the body or the flesh is weak. You ever just, I mean, you ever just think that? Sometimes I'm like, man, God, thanks for a new spirit, but why do you gotta keep me in this flesh, man? Oh, fresh new spirit. But we gotta keep these uh, flesh suits on until he calls us home and gives us a new body. A new body. I'm ready for the new body. How about you? 
Now, some of you are asking, well, why do we need to be ready? Why is this guy talking about be ready and screaming at me and spitting on us? And why is he all excited? Why, why, why do we need to be on guard? Number one, because the devil's coming for you. His mission is to kill, steal, and destroy God's purpose in your life. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around, here it is, like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Looking for someone to devour. I think it's interesting that it, that it, that it compares him to a lion. Lions, if you think about it, when they're attacking, who are they trying to attack? The weak one, the slow one. When we don't know our identity, we're weak. We're not walking in authority. So we're, we're, we're just opening ourselves up to be attacked, to fall into the temptation. I think the second reason is this, is sometimes you and I, we overestimate our strength. Come on, you ever walked with a new believer that's like set free and they're like six weeks in and they're like, yeah, I'm good now. Ooh, I'm like, uh, hold on now. Come on now, pride comes before the fall. We just, we just moved you from independence to dependent. Don't go, don't be moving back into independence now. There's something powerful. We gotta we got fight for this humility, this, this, this idea of, of staying tethered to Jesus, staying connected to Jesus, coming before the King of kings and the Lord of lords with reverence in the secret places. Anybody with me today? And when we stay in that place of humility and dependence, now, we get into this place where we don't overestimate our strengths. There's a so, sober warning in scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. It says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. Isn't it true? The devil's coming for us. Sometimes we overestimate our strength. And I know that some of you, you're tired today. You're like, I can't believe this guy is talking about this. I, have, I, I, I was tempted all week long and, and I'm just, I'm tired. And it is, it's fighting temptation is tiring. It takes so much energy and our willpower and self-control begins to wane. Is anybody with me in here today? So we know this, that, that man, the enemy wants to kill God's purpose for our life and in the same way that he came after Adam and Jesus is the same way uh, that he's coming after you and I, but we're gonna get ready. Y'all ready to get ready? Somebody say, stay ready. So I ain't gotta get ready. Here's how we're going to get ready. Number one, you can write it down. Stop flirting. Ooh. Stop flirting. I wrote this in my notes. You need to step away from the fence. I'll, I'll never forget this illustration, Pastor Ty Shenzel. I loved it. He, he gave this illustration. as like, think of a fence, and on, like, on one side, I'm walking in God's design for my life, in purity, honoring him, not perfect, but perfect in Christ, but continuing to walk out my salvation and sanctification. And then on the other side of the wall or the fence is sin, enemies camp, like just giving over to it, right? And I thought this illustration was so brilliant, but he said, so many of us, can you just kind of picture a fence right here? Can everybody just picture a fence right now? You know, some of us, we just like to live, we like to live life right here. Ooh, brushing up against it. Ooh, that grass looks greener on the other side, right? Isn't that how the enemy gets us? No, the grass is green where you water it. <laughs> and most of us, this is what we do. We live our life right here. We're just flirting, man. As a matter of fact, some of y'all are just, you're sitting on the fence right now. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, you're my victory. Woo! Next Friday night, uh, hey. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm just, oh, we, we can't be real in church. Okay, okay, okay. So what we need to do is we need to stop flirting. There's actually, it's funny, I, I, I wrote this quote down. Playwright Oscar Wilde said this jokingly. He remarked, I can resist everything except temptation. Isn't it true? We, we like pray, God, deliver me from the temptation. And then we just want the temptation to come visit us every once in a while. It's interesting because we, we, we've, we've, we've got we've to we've move the fence. We've got to move the line. We need a new line. And that's what Pastor Ty was saying. He's like, man, move away from the fence. 
Move away from that thing. Don't be like the guy I read about that was like going on a new diet and he shares this story about how, you know, he needed to lose some weight and he was on his way to work and he was driving on his way to work and he always would stop and get a coffee um, from Krispy Kreme. Now, what you know about Krispy Kreme is when the, when the hot and, what's, what is it with donuts today? <laughs> Y'all, must, you need to pray for your pastor, man, my goodness. But y'all know what I'm talking about. You drive by Krispy Kreme and that sign says hot and fresh or hot and ready, whatever it is. I don't know what it says, but I just know when that sign's on, I'm pulling into Krispy Kreme. So this, so this, oh, I love you. So this guy is, uh, he's driving. He's like, oh, I'm gonna, I need to stop and get a coffee, but this is where I go. And he's like, and then it dawned on him, like, oh, I'm on a diet. I don't know, man, that's kind of tempting. So he's like, Lord, if, the, if, 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 there's a, if there's a parking spot in the, in, in the front of the store when I drive by, then, then I feel like that's your invitation for me to pull in. And he's like, you know, surely there was a spot in the front row after driving around the block seven times. I mean, this is what we do. We're like, come on, do you want, I mean, do you want to be free or do you want to be free? Like some of y'all ladies, you know, you got the, the it ain't hot and ready uh, for Krispy Kreme, but man, Amazon Prime, oh boy. Like you're, you're just, you're, as a matter of you got tabs open right now. Like some of you just click the button, you just click the button and you're gonna get home and there's gonna be a package on your doorstep. Like, are you kidding me? You know, there's, there's other, others of us, we're spending like four hours a day on Instagram. Four hours a day. Or, or this, one, this one always gets me as, as leaders of men, and I'm just being real in church right now, and, and, uh, and, I, and I understand that, man, God hardwire, hardwired us a certain way. Like, he's given us this sexual desire, and so often the world is like, discipling us to walk out that sexual desire in an ungodly way. And so there's many men, probably even in this room, that like your, your struggle is pornography. And so, you know, whether it's Amazon Prime, whether it's Instagram, whether it's pornography, the question is, is are we gonna be real with whatever that struggle is? And are we gonna be willing to take the necessary steps to stop flirting with it and to get some, here's a, here it is, some accountability in our life. Like some of you women, seriously, if you have an overspending problem, like you might need to give your password away to one of your best friends. Or some of you, you need to set the limit on Instagram to 30 minutes, you can do that. You can actually do that on your phone. You could take that step today. There's some of you, you're struggling with pornography, you need to plug your phone in the other room. I, young men, I mean, I talk to them all the time, man, this is my struggle. Well, are you sleeping with your phone? Yeah, yeah, I sleep with my phone. It's like, bro, that's flirting. We, we gotta do something different. We need some accountability. Now, if you're in the room today and you're not surrounded in a group, you need to get in a group. You gotta show up to a group and be accountable to some people that can speak into your life and point you towards God's best of your life. Anybody thankful for their group in the building today? We're gonna get ready because number one, we're gonna stop flirting. But number two, here it is, write it down. We're gonna start fleeing. We're gonna start fleeing. Because here's, here's the trap that the enemy puts us in. Numbers 32, 23b says this, and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. I wrote this down, what's hidden today will come out in the light tomorrow. It might not exactly be tomorrow tomorrow, but God will bring it to the light. So you and I, we have, we have the decision. We can shine light on that thing before God shines light on it. I think of like this particular passage of scripture, we don't see, now here's what I want us to understand. Remember, um, God will lead us into the wilderness and sometimes, man, the enemy's just dragging us into the wilderness. I, the reason why we need to discern this is because in this particular instance with Jesus, God wasn't asking him to flee 
God was asking him to activate scripture. There was a testing that was happening. There was something that God wanted to do in that moment. And I think really just it was redemption, showing us the authority that we can have in Christ Jesus. So we don't see Jesus fleeing this moment, but there is a moment in scripture that I wanna draw our attention to that I think is incredibly powered. Do you remember the, the story of Joseph? In, in Genesis uh, chapter 39, I think that this is such a powerful picture of what it looks like to flee. Like some of us in here, we need to flee. We need to run. We need to move. We need to get away from the temptation. You know, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. Can you imagine? The people that are supposed to love him are selling him into slavery. And uh, he comes to be a servant in Potiphar's house. And here's what it says about Joseph in Genesis 39, 6 and 7. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. Joseph was very handsome and, well, and a well-built young man. And here it is, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Oh, hello, somebody. Who's this guy? Come and sleep with me, she demanded. Now, context here, Joseph is single. He could have been sour about his situation. I mean, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He could have been mad at God. As a matter of fact, there's some of you in here today that the reason that you've been giving in to temptation is because God didn't pull through like you thought he would. And so you've allowed your disappointment to justify your disobedience. But Joseph didn't do that. And day after day after day, Potiphar's wife was making moves until one day in Genesis 39, 12, she came and grabbed him by his cloak or his coat, demanding, come on, sleep with me. So what did Joseph do? Okay, let's do this thing. No, Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. We need to catch this today. Here it is. Joseph wasn't strong. He was ready. It was more important for him to be in good standing with God than it was for him to have his good coat. Somebody needs to get this in their spirit today, I'm telling you. He wanted to be in good standing with God more than he wanted to hold on to the good coat. Some of us need to flee today. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Here it is, but God is faithful. Somebody say faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, here it is, will all also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Is anybody thankful that God gives us a way out? Gives us a way out. Gives us a way out. So today we're gonna get ready. We gotta stay ready so we ain't gotta get ready and it's gonna start with, we're gonna stop, stop flirting. Number two, we're gonna start fleeing. Here's number three and what we'll finish with today. We're going to stay fighting. We're going to stay fighting. Somebody say stay fighting. Here's, here's how I want to say this another way. We're going to make scripture our standard, not our feelings. We're going to make scripture our standard, not our feelings. When Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, what does the Bible say? Here, three times over, Jesus replied, here, oh, the scriptures say, the scriptures say, the scriptures say, Jesus has given you and I a prescription for overcoming temptation in our life. He's saying, make scripture your standard, not your feelings, because scripture tells me who I am, so I know what to do. Is anybody with me today? It's like, it's like pre-deciding. The word becomes my values, and so I make decisions based on values, not on feelings. I love what Craig Rochelle says. He says this, the quality of your decisions determine the quality of your life. We make decisions, and then decisions make us, but the question is, is what is influencing the decisions that you and I make? Is it your feelings? Is it your desires? Or is it your values? Is it, is it the word of God that you've planted deep in your heart? Is it Job 31, men, that says, I'm gonna have eyes for my wife. So when I'm at the gym and I feel the temptation pulling me to start looking at all these other women, no, it's the word of God that's my standard. Standard over feelings. 
It's like pre-deciding. This is why I say, hey, hand me that reading guide right here. This ain't religious routine now. This is life and death. This is the difference between victory and being a victim. This right here is why we exist. Because when you plant the word of God in your life, you know who you are and now you can make the decisions that align with who God's called you to be. It goes back to what I was sharing. Jesus had identity. This is my beloved son in who I'm well pleased. And some of us need the revelation of sonship today because when you know your identity, now you can begin walking in authority. In authority. This is how we stay fighting. I love what James 4, 7 says. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil. And here it is. He will flee from you. You humble yourself before God by hiding his word in your heart. We're going to fight temptation with the word of God. It's like what David said. I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let the word of God dwell richly in you today. Is anybody with me today? This is what we're going to do. We're going to stop flirting. We're going to start fleeing. We're going to stay fighting. We're going to stay ready so we don't have to get ready. Is anybody with me today? I was talking to my dad yesterday, and uh, I'm super proud of you. I'm super proud of you. Eight months ago, he said no more alcohol. He's eight, eight months sober. I remember when I remember uh, when he called me to talk to me about this, and uh, it was great. We had an amazing discussion. And, and you know what I told my dad, and this is what I tell all the guys, you, y'all, y'all in my men's group, you know this: alcohol isn't your problem. Alcohol is what you use to cover up the problem. There, there are just, in all of us, we all experience woundedness and difficulty. And you know what most of us do? Is then, and this is what I need us to understand. When you're wounded, you're most open to be the enemy coming in. That's when you're vulnerable. So you ran to drugs or sex or spending or whatever the case is. And yes, now we need to deal with that issue. But there's an issue beneath the surface that needs to be dealt with. And it was funny because we were, we were laughing and joking. And I love the self-awareness. He said, uh, he said, he said yeah, I'm, I'm eight months sober. Have, you know, haven't been drinking alcohol. But the last few weeks, I realized that, man, I've been eating a lot of chocolate. <laughs> I have him to blame for my sweet tooth. Oh, no, we're going we to break off that generational pattern today in the name of Jesus. Bridge mix. We were laughing about it. Yeah. That stuff that's like five bucks at high V. My man just scarfing it down. He's recognizing that the temptation to go to the booze hasn't been there, but to go to the chocolate has been. And he, but here's the thing. He's saying, man, I don't want to do that any longer. Went to his mentor. His mentor's like, hey, man, the same way that you were able to overcome alcohol is the same way that you're going to be over, overcome, overcome the chocolate. And so what is it? Yeah, come on. You can give God some praise for that. So what is it for you today? Where are you vulnerable? Where are you vulnerable? Maybe it's in your pride. Maybe it's in materialism, greed, comparison. I don't know what it is, but here's what I do know is that God wants you to be ready so you don't got to get ready. He wants you to stop flirting. He wants you to start fleeing. He wants you to stay fighting so that you can walk out God's best for your life. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this word that you've given us a game plan on how we can overcome temptation. So God, I just pray even now that you would just continue to minister to us, that you would would strengthen us today, that you would fortify us today, that there would be a level of humility, honesty, and vulnerability in the room today. That we wouldn't keep our sin or the temptation that we're struggling with in the dark any longer. That we would just openly bring it to the light. And as we bring it to the light, chains and weight would fall off and a new level of freedom would enter in. We know you can do this by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name.
Now I wanna specifically just take in this moment of response. I know that some of you are being stirred up today. Just if, if, if you'd be so honest in here today, if you're, if you're like, you know what, I wanna overcome temptation in my life, the one that I'm struggling with, just lift your hand in the air. I wanna pray for every single one of you in the room. Yep, I see hands all over. God, thank you for your people today that are, that are honest about the temptation that they're battling. And I pray, God, that you would help them to stop flirting, to start fleeing, and to stay fighting. God, I pray they wouldn't do it in their own strength, but they would do it in the strength of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Now, before I say amen, I recognize that there's some of you in this room today. Um, and this is, this is just such an, it's been such an interesting week for me. It's so bizarre that we're walking through this very, through a very similar time. But on Friday night, um, I had the, the honor and the privilege of doing my father-in-law's uh, celebration of life service. We, we lost him a couple weeks ago and it's been a, a really difficult time. But anytime death happens close to you, you're reminded of the brevity of life. And man, talk about being ready. Talk about staying ready so you don't have to get ready. The reality is, is man, the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. It'll just either happen while you're here on earth or after you take your last breath. But the problem is, my friends, is that if you wait to confess Lord, confess Jesus as Lord until after you leave the earth, it's too late. This isn't his heart for us. But I need you to understand this in here today that God is holy, he's blameless, and he can't have anything to do with sin. And the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that creates a chasm. That creates a separation. And this is a problem, y'all. It's a big problem. Because it doesn't just mean separation in this life, but in the life to come. But Jesus loved you and I so much that he left heaven on the greatest rescue mission of all time. He came and lived the life that you and I could never live. He went to the cross we, and, he, and he died a brutal criminal's death. He was crucified. They put him in a grave and three days later he rose and that's what we celebrated last week is that the grave is empty. And the same spirit that lifted him out of that grave is the same spirit that roams throughout the earth and invites people into relationship. Jesus created you and I for connection, for fellowship, for relationship. And the opportunity here today to make peace with God is it's available. Today is, could be your day. Today is the day that you could say, man, I don't know how much more life I have, but I'm gonna be ready. And when I take my last breath here on this earth, it's gonna be my first breath in glory and heaven with God for all of eternity. Do you want that in here today? I don't know where you're at in the room today, but let's go ahead and stand to our feet. And I'm gonna ask you to take a bold